Okay, great. So the first sort of um, paper that I'm going to be talking about is called Emergent Abilities of Large Language Models. Um, and this paper was especially cool, uh, I think, because we got people from Google and DeepMind and, and also at Stanford, I, you might recognize Percy or Tatsu or uh, Rishi. I mean, we got people to sort of agree on what's a nice framework of looking at why we want to scale um, and emerge abilities. Um, so uh, one of the things that we've seen throughout um, language models is that you sort of get these predictable gains as a result of scaling. So here's the canonical, you know, Kaplan uh, et al. paper, um, where you can see that uh, if you scale up the size of the language model, measured either in compute, uh, in data set size, or in parameters, uh, you see that the uh, loss uh, on, on the test set actually goes down predictably. Real quick. Yeah. I don't know if you're screen sharing. So people in Zoom, I don't think, can see oh, the slides. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Let me fix that. All these technical. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I guess I'll say this for the third time. Uh, as, as we've seen in language models, um, if you scale up the size of the language model, uh, measured either in compute, uh, in data set size, or a number of parameters, you can see that there's a sort of this predictable uh, improvement in the test loss. Um, now, what I'm going to be talking about in terms of emergence is something that's actually unpredictable um, if you only look at smaller language models. So uh, one way that emergence has been described in the broader science literature is it's basically seen as a qualitative change that arises from quantitative changes. Um, it sort of started with this um, article in Science by uh, a Nobel Prize winning physicist called More is Different. Um, and uh, I really like this post from uh, Jacob Steindart that sort of describes emergence. And, and he, he gives a couple of good examples here. Um, for example, he says with uranium, uh, with a bit of uranium, nothing special happens. Uh, with a large amount of uranium packed densely enough, you get a nuclear reaction. Um, and then also with DNA, for example, given only small molecules such as calcium, you can't meaningfully encode useful information, but given larger models such as DNA, you can encode a genome. Um, so uh, for this particular work, uh, we use this definition of uh, emerge abilities of large language models in particular. So we uh, say that ability is emergent if it is not present in smaller models, but it is present in larger models. Um, and the sort of uh, natural question here is like, how do you measure the size um, or the scale of the language model? Um, and there's sort of traditionally three um, axes of scale. So the training flops are the amount of compute uh, that you use to train the language model. Um, the number of model parameters or like the, the size of the language model, and also the size of the training data set that the model is trained on. Um, and a lot of the plots here will use either training flops or the number of model parameters. Um, the reason is that the training data set size is usually fixed uh, for, for different size models. Uh, and because training flops is just the data set size times model parameters, um, you, it, it, you can get a similar plot uh, from either training flops or number of model parameters for most uh, language models. Um, great. And so the first type of emergence, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. For me, it, it seems naively like it would be relatively easier to measure the size versus like what qualifies as natural ability. Like, how do you define what counts as like natural ability versus not? Um, yeah, sure. Like, an ability, like, yeah. So yeah, for example, uh, I'll just give a I'll just give an example here, which is actually the next slide. Um, so basically, we have this way of interacting with language models called few shot prompting. Um, and the way it works is like, you know, the language model is a really good next word predictor. Um, and uh, when you give the model uh, an example, um, and then you ask it for an unseen, uh, an unseen um, like movie review, for example, um, and then you say, what's the output? Uh, and then here the language model can say positive because it understands to use the context from the review uh, to, to give the next token. Um, and the definition of we, uh, that we use for like having ability or not um, is that basically a few shot prompted like task, for example, uh, sentiment analysis um, is emergent if it has random accuracy for small models, but above random accuracy for large models. Does that make sense? So basically if, if the model isn't doing any better than random, then we say it doesn't have the ability to do this particular task. Cool. Um, and I'll, I'll give a few examples here. Um, 
So here's sort of the canonical way that we look at plots for emergence. So basically, um, uh, what we have each of these uh, different plots is a different task, and I'll go over some examples soon. Um, but the way you read the plot is the x-axis is the number of uh, training flops uh, or the model scale, um, and then the y-axis is like the accuracy or like how good the model is doing the task. Um, and then uh, we, you know we have different language models from OpenAI, from Google, and from DeepMind. Um, and then each of the points is like a different language model. It's not um, a language model over the course of training, like each point is a different language model. Um, and what you see is that for the very small language models, um, you, you basically get a uh, performance that's, that's close to random or not being any better than random. Um, and then once you pass a certain threshold, um, you can see that the, the, the performance suddenly gets like a lot above, uh, uh, su substantially above random. Um, and this is what we call emergence. So basically, if you were to extrapolate like the lines uh, from the small language models, you might predict that it would never you know, do better than random because it's just a flat line. Um, but the interesting phenomenon is that when you scale up past a th certain threshold, you actually do see this emergent phenomenon where the model does a lot better than random. Um, so let me go over some like concrete examples. Um, so here's uh, one task. Uh, it's basically a benchmark uh, called uh, multitask NLU or, or MMLU. Um, and basically uh, what it is, it's, it's a bunch of uh, test questions uh, ranging from high school all the way to like professional level exams. Um, and how it works is the language model is sort of given, uh, for example, here is a high school math um, example. Um, and the language model is given like a few examples and then for an unseen question, it has to give the answer. Um, and then you can see in the plot on the right, uh, so for the model scale, uh, if you go up to sort of uh, 10 to the power of 22 training flops, you don't actually get any better than random accuracy on this task. But if you scale up to 10 to the 24 training flops, um, then you see that all the like three models there uh, do much better than, uh, than random accuracy. Um, yeah, go ahead. The scale of the data used to train this, is it roughly similar? Or because these are like different models trained by different orgs? Um, yeah, the scale is, uh, I think, within an order of magnitude for, for these models here. Yeah. Yeah. And like every single dot on each individual tracks is the same data. Uh, yes, the data, the data is fixed um, except for Chinchilla. Chinchilla uses more data for larger models, but um, I believe yeah, for all the other models here, the, the amount of data is, is the same. Um, yeah, here, here's just another example to, to sort of um, show it more concretely. So this is a uh, task from the Big Bench benchmark. Um, just as an aside, the Big Bench benchmark is like 200 um, benchmarks. Uh, and basically it's like a crowdsource um, set of benchmarks I'd recommend looking at if you're doing like a model work. Um, and basically the task is, the language model has to take an English sentence um, and then give the international phonetic alphabet uh, transliteration, the IPA transliteration, which is basically like how to pronounce it. Um, and for this for this uh, task, the evaluation metric is actually blue or like an n-gram um, overlap metric. Um, and, and you get a similar uh, uh, phenomenon where as you uh, uh, increase the size of the language model, uh, it's flat for a while, and then suddenly the improvement is above random. Um, great. So uh, I'll talk about another uh, interesting result I hear that that's related to emergence. So this was a technical report that we put out um, a couple of months ago. Um, and basically there's this really interesting prize um, in, or it's like a, a one-time prize in, um, uh, in language models where uh, Anthropics, which is like a, a startup, um, basically had this prize where if people could come up with a task where the performance um, on the task would actually decrease um, uh, as you increase the size of the language model, uh, then you would get like a, a bunch of money. So basically there are a lot of submissions to this. And here's one example of like a task where they found that the performance would actually decrease if you increase the size of the language model. Um, so the task is, I'll just read it here. It's like, repeat my sentences back to me. And then uh, the input is like, all that glisters is not glib. And then the output is, uh, you, you, the model has to completely, uh, has to accurately say a uh, glib. Um, and so what happened is for the uh, small language model, 
Um, it doesn't know the phrase, all that glisters is not gold. So it just like copies the input and actually does get, it's like hundred percent on that. Um, but then for the medium size language model, uh, what you would see is that the performance actually decreased because the medium size language model knows the phrase, all that glisters is not gold. And then it, it says gold, which actually is not what the task asks it to do. Yeah, go ahead. Someone on Zoom asks, can you give a physical estimate of 10 to the 24 plots, possibly in terms of training time or number of GPUs? Um, yeah, so I think um, uh, 10 to the 24 flops uh, is around, so at Google we use TPUs, um, and one pod of TPUs I believe is equal to like 4,000 A100s, um, and 10 to the 24 flops is like two pods uh, for around six weeks or something like that. Um, so it's a lot of compute to do the pre-training. Um, I don't know, but do you guys remember in like chemistry class when you'd have like moles <laughs> and it would be like 10 to the 23 and then you're like, teacher would be like, oh, don't even think about like how big this number is. <laughs> That's like the number of like floating point operations that uh, goes into the pre-training of some of these models. Um, okay, great, anyways. Uh, so um, yeah, so, so basically the medium sized language model will actually do worse. Oh yeah, did you have another question? Yeah. Oh wait. Is, did this one win the prize or not? I'm like, um, this one is uh, one of the 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 winner. I think it's like a third place winner or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Returns to like my question about like what counts as a as a task because like I would think my initial opinion would be like oh you can just like flip a negative sign on how you evaluate your task. And then we'll... Uh, what do you mean flip a negative sign? Well, because like all of this depends on like which evaluation scheme. Yeah. To, to measure if you do your task grade. So like it's like the 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 measurement is very sparse. Like you only get credit if you do it perfectly or something. But yeah, yeah. Can, like show a lot of things emerge because like you just won't hit it perfectly until like it's like really optimized for a long time. Or like if you take a task and then like uh, evaluate with like its minus sign, like wouldn't it like get worse? As, like, like something that's like, oh. like predictive. Yeah, I mean, they, they, so for this thing, they like accounted for all, like, you can't just say like the task should be to do badly on something. It has to be like a meaningful sort of task. Um, and then I guess your, your point about like the, how credits time or the evaluation metric works is actually a really good one. Um, yeah, so I guess it still kind of counts if like, you know, uh, I, I guess the, the argument is sort of that the, the, um, the performance might not look emergent if you assign partial credit. Um, but we have like a bunch of, uh, I can show an example later, but um, even if you use partial credit metrics, you'll often still see the same type of emergence. Um, so it's not purely a phenomenon of like uh, not assigning partial credit based on the valuation metric. Um, cool. Um, and then, uh, great. So what, what we sort of, sort of argued in this paper is that, yeah, there might be some tasks where the performance starts to decrease if you use a medium sized language model. Um, but if you keep scaling uh, uh, all the way to, you know, the largest model that we have at, at Google that's known publicly, uh, Palm, uh, you'll see that uh, the, the language model, I can actually go back and do the task correctly because uh, the large language model uh, also knows the phrase, all that glisters is not gold, uh, but uh, it also understands repeat my senses back to me. Um, so it's able to, to get 100% uh, on this task. So this is a different type of... Uh, Emergence also. Um, uh, and a, uh, another class of emergence that we sort of talk about um, in the paper is like an emergent prompting technique. Um, so basically, uh, you know, other than few shot prompting, there's like other ways of like interacting with the language models um, that uh, uh, can be considered emergent. Yeah. Can I interrupt? Sorry, somebody else had a question on the previous slide yeah. before we move on. Um, the question is, did all models undergo instruction fine-tuning? Um, none of these models uh, underwent instruction fine-tuning for, for this plot. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah, so, so, um, yeah, so one way of interacting with language models is uh, uh, it, by basically fine-tuning the model um, using a technique called RLHF. And, and basically the way it works is you have this data um, and humans rate like preferences for what type of outputs they prefer. 
And then the model is trained on RL to sort of optimize for uh, human preferences. Um, and what this plot is showing here uh, is that if you do this RLHF on the model, uh, the model performance um, on a different zero shot task actually gets worse for small models. You can see the, the blue line is above the orange line. Blue line is the baseline, the orange line is RLHF. Um, and then if you do it for large models though, uh, then you can see that the performance um, actually has a positive delta from doing RLHF. Um, and so th this is sort of an interesting thing where like a certain technique might only help if you try on a large enough language model. So if you only try it on the small, small language models, uh, it'd be tough to draw the conclusion that uh, it, it wouldn't help performance. Um, and then later I'll talk about chain of thought prompting as, as another emergent uh, prompting technique. Um, so here's sort of the hand wavy diagram that I sort of used to, to think about uh, emergence um, as a framework. So um, on the x-axis here, we, the, there's like a scale of the language model. And on the y-axis is a sort of imaginary like, you know, uh, a scale of like a range of things that a language model can do. And then basically you can pick like some random point, like say hundred billion parameters in the language model. Um, and there will be certain abilities. Um, and okay, so first you can see as you increase the size of the language model, the number of like tasks or things the language model can do increases. Um, and then you can see there are some tasks where um, a one, like a models above 100 billion parameters, for example, can do them, but models below 100 billion parameters can't do them, and we, we call these emergent abilities. Sorry, quick question about yeah. Where are the colors? Oh, it's just highlighting like um, the dark blue is like tasks that a smaller language model wouldn't be able to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then to the right, the dotted line, the white region up top, um, oh, that just means like tasks that we haven't been able to, to solve yet with language models. Yeah, cool. And I'm curious to know, do you think that it's not that those tasks in the white region are unsolvable at like 100 billion scale? Or do you think that better models, specific training data would allow us to at the 100 billion scale to get into that white region? Yeah, I definitely think that um, it's not a, a fixed, um, uh, I'll give an example shortly, but it's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's not um, a rule that you have to have 100 billion parameters to do a certain task. It's just that that happens to be the threshold that we, we've observed in models so far. And I do think with better training uh, data and architecture and uh, algorithms, we can probably beat that. Cool. Um, yeah, so as Ryland just mentioned, um, one example of uh, getting emergence uh, can be with better data. So it's not all about scale. I'll, I'll sort of give some nuance here. So um, for this task this is just uh, one of the tasks in the Big Bench benchmark. Um, you can see that for like Lambda, which is a Google model and GPT-3, um, you actually don't get emergence from scaling to 137 or, 100, uh, 137 or 175 billion parameters. Um, but uh, when you come in with a different language model, Palm, uh, which is trained on better data um, than, than Lambda and GPT-3, you actually can get this emergent ability even with the smaller language model, so in here at 62 billion parameters. So you prefer yeah. a better model as better data or also better architectural loss chain, you know, choices or mostly just data quality? Um, yeah, so so the, the challenging thing is, that's a great question. Um, there's like a lot of differences between Palm and, and, and Lambda, for example. And we can't really ablate them in any controlled way because of the cost of, of pre-training. Um, but our like sort of running hypothesis is that Palm is trained on better data and that accounts for a lot of the difference between um, Palm and Lambda. I see in like the smaller scales where it is possible to ablate stuff. Yeah. Perform some really architectural ways. Does anyone look into it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I guess even here you can look at like, for example, the Palm 8 billion model, <laughs> like that, that point there. Um, you can ablate it and it's like a little bit higher, but it's not really an emergent yet at that point. So it's hard to, it's hard to tell for, you know, for example, this particular task, what the effect is. Thanks. Yeah. There's a question on Zoom. Yeah. Um, are there two different versions of Palm? If not, why are there two lines for it? Oh, so uh, I think the two lines here, one is like uh, maybe three shot and then one is like zero shot. Um, something like that. So it, it just refers to the, the way that we're using the language model, either with or without exemplars.
Um, great. Uh, I'll talk about a <coughs> yeah a small ablation here that sort of shows this. So uh, this is an ablation on sort of a, a toy task uh, where uh, basically the language model has to know that like in English, you have to use plural verbs with plural subjects and singular verbs with uh, singular subjects. Um, and uh, the way that what we're doing here is basically we train like these small BERT models from scratch. Um, and then we held out like, uh, we, we fixed the frequency of certain verbs in the training data set, which basically says like, okay, what's the effect of seeing um, a certain verb in the data more often? Um, in this plot, uh, the x-axis is like the frequency of the verb um, and the y-axis is the error rate. Um, and what you basically see is that um, uh, if you have more in-domain data, so if the model sees the verb more times, uh, it does the task a lot better. Um, and this is sort of an example of like having higher quality data, data or data that's more in domain for the tasks that you're evaluating on um, can make a big difference, even if you're fixing uh, the compute, the size of the model and, and the rest of the data. Yeah. Question on Zoom. Someone asks, could there be a way to distill convergent abilities down to smaller models from larger teacher models? Um, yeah, I think so. So, um, larger teacher models uh, can basically you can use them, for example, to generate data. Um, and then if you fine tune the larger, the smaller model on data, um, it's pretty likely that you'll be able to uh, get the ability to emerge in the smaller model. Um, I'll talk about an example of this too, let me see. Oh, actually, that's the next slide. So um, desired behaviors can be induced in smaller models uh, once you sort of know what behavior you want. Um, so for example, uh, here's the instruct GPT, uh, uh, here's a figure from the Instruct GPT paper. Um, and basically, uh, the desired behavior here is like instruction following. Um, and you can see that uh, there's multiple models. So on the left, you have these small models that are trained with RLHF. Um, and they actually have better performance uh, than larger models trained on weaker techniques. Um, so you can, you can, so basically the point is like, if you know that you want a certain behavior, um, that sort of you saw previously in, in, a, in, an emerg uh, in an emergent way in a larger model, um, you can find a way to fine tune on that behavior specifically um, and induce that behavior in a smaller model. But I guess that one of the limitations is that like, you, unless you know like all the behaviors that you want, you can't really uh, get this natural emergent behavior. Um, uh, I, uh, yeah, another sort of discussion point here is that like, there's this question of like, what's the right x-axis for emergence? So like right now we mostly talk about like model parameters and training flops, but like, I guess you could like, if you ask DeepMind people like how they look at it, you'll sort of get this argument that model parameters and training flops are really just a proxy for like how good the model is. Um, and how good the model is can really be measured by like uh, perplexity or like how well it's doing on some on some uh, dev sets, such as Wikitext 103. Um, so basically, you can also measure um, uh, emergence in terms of per perplexity. So, so here is um, Wikitext perplexity. Um, and then you can see like on a downstream task that as the perplexity uh, gets better, there's sort of this threshold where you're able to do a lot better um, on the downstream task. Um, and there's sort of a strong correlation, right? at least right now, between perplexity and training compute. So you can see like these two lines are are pretty similar. And um, basically I think uh, in the future, if we have you know much better models that are a lot smaller, trying on much better data and better algorithms, then maybe Wikitext perplexity can show a different type of um, plot than using other uh, metrics. Yeah, go ahead. So Wikitext uh, is basically um, a, uh, I think it's like a subset of Wikipedia. Um, and then perplexity is like a measure of how well uh, you can predict the next word in a data set. Um, so basically, if, you, if you're really good at modeling the next word on this like particular evaluation set, um, that, that's sort of a measure of like how well you understand language. Does that make sense? Oh, this is like a held out uh, test set. Um, and then uh, a final thing that I think is like pretty exciting about emergence um, is that there's sort of uh, not just like technical emergence that we've talked about, 
but there's sort of sociological changes in how the AI community views like scaling and how to use language models. Um, so here's some examples uh, of um, where scaling up the size of the language model uh, enables you to, in this sort of few shot scenario, uh, beat a task specific fine tuned language model that's usually fine tuned on say thousands of, of, of examples. Um, so basically the green line uh, is the prior state of the art achieved by fine tuning. Um, and then if you just, uh, and, th and then the blue dots basically show if you take a pre-trained language model and you do few shot prompting, which means the language model isn't intentionally trained to do the task, um, you can often get state of the art results just by continuing to scale up the size of the language model. Um, and obviously there's, there's, there's limitations here. You don't wanna just keep scaling up in order to get state of the art. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a pretty big change in people's minds that you could actually get some of the best results uh, just by scaling up the size of the language model and doing prompting. Question from Zoom. Someone yeah. asks, is that not a contradiction with the graph from two to three slides ago? What does that mean? Uh, which one? This one? Sure. Um, should we in general assume, oh, he said yes. <laughs> okay. He said, should we in general assume that scale trumps fine tuning? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Uh, so this plot is saying that um, you fine tune and you can do, uh, and, and okay, yeah. So uh, it depends on your like particular um, uh, task, uh, but what this plot is saying um, is that uh, f like we're not uh, like fi fine tuned smaller models um, can do well on some tasks if you if you target it well, but for like tasks that are more complicated, um, often you can do better just by scaling. Um, so there's sort of uh, tasks that fall into both of these categories, uh, and I wouldn't say that um, it's contradictory. I guess some tasks um, you would do a lot better uh, just by um, just by scaling up the size of the model, and then other tasks uh, if it's like a very narrow domain or the large language model. Um, might not be trained on that kind of data, um, then you would do better by fine tuning. Okay, great. Um, so here's sort of a, a little summary slide. Um, so basically emergent abilities can only be observed in large models. And if you try to predict uh, their emergence just by looking at the plots for small models, then you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and uh, I, I sort of had a little reflection on how to look at this. Um, so emergence is really this framing of like, uh, uh, how to view new abilities that are not intentionally built in uh, to the pre-training. Um, and I think the subtext for this is super important, which is like, you can see it as an implicit argument for why we should keep scaling up language models um, because you, don't, you get these abilities that are really hard to find otherwise. Um, and the context around this is pretty important because um, it, it's really expensive to, to continue scaling up these models. And, um, you know, even like one year ago, a lot of people didn't believe that you could do better on certain tasks just by scaling up the size of the language model. Um, there's sort of, uh, if you work in industry at all, there's like this interesting tension between emergence um, and also like many production tasks. So emergence is sort of this like task general phenomena where you scale up the model and it's like really expensive, but the single model can do a lot of tasks. This is sort of like a, uh, in the direction of AGI. Um, and then for many production tasks, you have sort of the opposite where um, you know what task it is, for example, translating to Spanish. Um, and then you have these constraints on compute because you know when you build Google Translate, for example, you don't want people to have to wait a couple seconds just to get the translation. Um, and then you also happen to have a lot of in-domain data. Uh, so you have, for example, like you know, a million uh, pairs of English Spanish sentences to, to train on. Um, and this is like sort of the opposite setting where you don't really care about uh, the, the model's emergence. Um, you, you can just train a very small model on the data and do well on the task um, without having to use a lot of compute. Um, and the final point is that um, I think uh, a really promising research direction, if anyone is interested in doing research, is to like work on predicting future emergent abilities. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of work on it recently just because I think uh, maybe it's too hard, for example, like you can only like predict emergence for a specific task um, uh, or like one way of predicting emergence might not be super general. And uh, so so I haven't seen much work on that, but I think this is a pretty promising direction to work on. Um, and maybe Anthropic is working on it, I don't know. 
Um, okay, great. Any questions on that before I move on to chain of thought content? Yeah, go ahead. Do we have a, like, do we have any theoretical basis for predicting which parameters are best scaled to get like merger properties? Because obviously there are many different options for where you add more parameters. Where you add like, uh, like you can, like GPD, for example, you could like add more in the embedding layer. You add more in like whatever. Is that mostly something we just test and then we find out which ones scale better and get the better results? Or like, yeah, I would say that we don't have very principled methods for like how to scale these architectures. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but some of it has to deal with like uh, how many parameters you can fit onto a particular uh, TPU. Um, uh, but in general, I think you scale up like the number of intentions heads um, and the embeddings like somewhat proportionally. Um, but yeah, I think this is like an open research question. And, and because, you know, you can't really do ablations over these, these pre-training, um, you can't really do ablations over pre-training. It's hard to sort of, uh, you know, uh, have any principled way uh, of doing it other than some engineers who are in charge of like doing it saying, okay, I think this is the right thing to do. And then it, it kind of works and you go with it. Yeah. Uh, do you have any indication of the asymptotic behavior of the scaling? If you expect that uh, eventually it would, you know, reach either some plateau of like finite but non-zero loss, or it would it just go all the way down to zero? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, there's, uh, you mean on like uh, perplexity or like some, uh, on a particular task or just in general on like next word prediction? Well, it seems like these results are pretty general, pretty task independent, right? Uh -huh. It's like emergent scaling. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you take the limit of infinite parameters, then even analytically, is there any sense of whether that, how that converges? Yeah, I have no clue. Um, I think if, if uh, like for most of these tasks, there's like a limit to accuracy, like 100%, for example. So there's some there's some sort of asymptote there, but I guess um, the deeper question that you, you might be asking is like, can a language model like perfectly know like, you know, how to predict the next word for any given input? Um, and maybe like, I mean, I guess there's some like limit to like, um, like if I say a sentence, um, there are like two possible next words or something, and you might not be able to get to guess that perfectly. Um, so I think there's some limit, but like I think we're far from reaching that limit, and there's still a lot of unsolved tasks that um, sort of indicate that there's a lot of headroom. Yeah. If researchers are interested in studying emergence, yeah. what family of differently sized models is publicly available or best for studying this? Yeah, good question. Um, so uh, I think the OpenAI API has like a, a lot of language models and we actually use that a lot even at Google to, use, to study emergence. Um, and that's sort of one way of doing it. Um, and actually a lot of these models are currently free. Um, they're rate limited, but they're free. So, that, so we also use that. Um, I think there's also uh, smaller language models. Like for example, there's like a UL2 model that's like 20 billion parameters. Um, but I guess you're right, there, there is sort of this challenge where like the small language models, you won't see a lot of these emergent behaviors. So you kind of have to um, either train, um, uh, yeah, so you kind of have to uh, either use like OpenAI API for now or, or wait until people train larger models. I guess there's also the uh, Bloom and like, you guys probably know better than me, like OPT models that are publicly available, but I haven't seen a lot of experiments on them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um. So like my question is, is are there are there emergent abilities that like are accessible in lower parameter regimes? I can think of um, like part of speech tagging or like speech recognition. Like there should, or, I would expect maybe there might be like some that are maybe not like chain of thought, but like are there some that are like yeah, definitely. I think uh, in, in the paper, we had like a list of a couple dozen abilities that would be emergent at like 8 billion parameters or like 60 billion parameters, something like that. Yeah. 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 We have two questions from Zoom. The first question is, do you see strategy tactics between the larger tech firms differing systematically in studying these models, or is basically everyone taking the same approach? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say that everyone is taking the same approach. Um, I think as one example, Anthropic takes like a very safety-centric approach. 
Um, and they're super interested in like emergent abilities because uh, there could be emergent abilities that are undesirable and they want to predict those types of things. Um, I also don't know what happens at other companies other than at Google, so I can't really speak too much to, to that. Yeah. The second question, what are some examples of tasks or abilities that have not yet emerged even in models like Lambda, ChatGPT, et cetera? Oh, yeah, I have, uh, maybe I'll just show this real quick. Uh, um, there's like a nice list somewhere. So, so yeah, so basically <clears throat> what we did is um, there's like 200 tasks in Big Bench. And then we basically classified them into like smoothly increasing, um, emergent with GPT-3 or Lambda, emergent with Palm, and then flat, which is like no model better than random. So I think if you look at any of these tasks here, um, they should still not have emerged yet. Um, and if you can uh, get them to emerge, that'd be interesting. Sorry? I think ChatGPT could be 20 questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is not a super. Uh, I think this is like a couple months old. So, oh, sorry. yeah, yeah. Oh, 20 questions. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I think like the cool thing is like you can see over time, right? Like originally, like maybe only like these were, you know, emergent, and then when Palm came out, you'd see a couple dozen more abilities became emergent, and then, you know, I suspect, um, you know, in a year or two, most of these will become emergent and. Uh, We'll need harder benchmarks. Yeah. There's another question on Zoom. Why doesn't Google take as much of a safety-centered approach like you said Anthropic does? Are there reasons to believe harmful capabilities wouldn't be emerging? Um, yeah, I don't want to answer the question on behalf of Google. I just can only talk about uh, my own opinions. Um, but I think the reality is that Google, if, even if you look at like the amount of research that Google does, it might not be in the a uh, large language model space specifically, but like the amount of safety research uh, that we do, I think is more than Anthropic if you if you actually look at like the number of papers published. Don't quote me on this, but uh, I think that's correct. Um, okay. Uh, great. So yeah, I'll talk about um, chain of thought prompting. So basically chain of thought prompting is uh, this way of doing reasoning, multi-step reasoning with large language models. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to say that like, it's super exciting to see like a lot of people at Google working on this and also to see um, uh, Sundar, our CEO, present this um, at our last year's uh, Google I.O. press event. Um, and uh, basically uh, the motivation for this is that we want language models to do like uh, more complicated tasks that, you know, for example, uh, we know language models can do easy tasks like sentiment analysis or, or translation, but what about like more complicated tasks that might even take a human uh, a minute or, or more to do? Um, and the goal here is to basically guide them with metadata. Uh, so for example, instead of just giving like an input output pair, uh, we want to give them the entire reasoning process uh, and have them mimic that. Um, and the, basically you can see here, uh, you know, in a standard prompt, you have like the question and then the answer, and then you have a question and the model gives a new answer. Unfortunately, it's wrong. Um, and then with chain of thought prompting, um, uh, you give the model a question and then kind of like how your teacher would ask you to show your work, uh, you give like the, uh, the chain of thought is what we call it, or basically a reasoning path. Um, and then you give the final answer. And then when the model sees this unseen question, now it's able to give the reasoning path and then give the correct final answer. Um, and the way that we add these uh, prompts into the prompt is basically we just manually write a couple and then add it into the prompt. Um, so let me just show how that works. Um, so this is the OpenAI API. And basically, uh, here's like the non chain of thought way of doing it. So basically you would have um, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, and then new question about, you know, cafeteria has 23 apples. They used 20 to make lunch and bought six more. How many apples do they have? Um, and the model uh, gets it wrong. 
Um, and the only difference with chain of thought is that you give these uh, intermediate reasoning paths um, before giving the final answer. So here's a path, there's a, there's a reasoning chain, uh, there's another reasoning chain. And then uh, now the model for this unseen question uh, gives the entire reasoning process. Um, and then this actually enables the model to get it correct. I'll give another quick example. Uh, this one. So here the task is uh, just take the last letters of the words in Bill Gates. So like L from Bill and S from Gates and then concatenate them and uh, the, the answer should be LS. Um, and then here the model gets it wrong. The answer should be NK. So it's SK. And then uh, if you do chain of thought, obviously uh, this has become, it becomes very easy for the model. So, you know, it says the last letter of Bill is L, the last letter of Gates is S, the answer is LS. Uh, and then here it's able to do the last letter of Elon is M, and the last letter of Musk is K, and the answer is NK. Um, so any, any, is this clear? Any questions about what's going on here? Okay, great. Um, so basically we can have these similar plots where the x-axis is the model scale, the y-axis is the performance. Um, so on the left, we have this math word question benchmark called GSMAK. It's basically like questions that you'd see in like an elementary school math test. Um, and you can see the, the blue dot is standard and the purple star is chain of thought. Um, and basically you see that the chain of thought, uh, if you use a large enough model, uh, does a lot better uh, than standard um, prompting. Um, it actually beats the fine-tuned state of the art um, at the time. Um, a similar example is, is uh, on this benchmark called Strategy QA. Um, and what Strategy QA is, is it's basically like this uh, world knowledge plus common sense reasoning benchmark. So the question would be like, can you hide a basketball in a sand cat's ear? Um, and then the model would uh, say like, you know, a basketball is about this size, a sand cat's ear is that, so it would not fit. Um, and now this benchmark, you can also see that we can beat the fine-tuned state of the art um, from before uh, just by using chain of thought with a large enough language model. Um, so one way we use this is that we um, evaluate a chain of thought on uh, a certain subset of, of big bench uh, tasks. So um, we created this subset called big bench hard. And basically it's like 23 challenging tasks from big bench where like no model had done better uh, than uh, the average human rater. Um, so the way that you prompt the model is that you'd have like a task description, question, options, chain of thought, uh, and then the test time question. Um, and so I'll give a couple of examples of like tasks here. Uh, so uh, one example is navigate. Uh, basically what the language model has to do in this task is uh, it has to basically follow these. So the question is like, if you follow these instructions, do you return to the starting point? Turn left, turn right, take five steps, take four steps, turn around, take nine steps. Um, and then uh, the model uh, following the few shot exemplars uh, is able to like basically track state after all of, uh, all of the actions. And then at the end it says, okay, uh, are we at the final answer? So the answer, uh, are, we at the final, are we at the original location? Um, and if it is zero, zero, the answer is yes. Um, just to give an example of another task, um, here's a task that's like very easy for humans, basically word sorting. So like there's a list of words, Burley, Bela, I'm not gonna read them. And basically uh, the model has to sort them um, in alphabetical order. Um, and here the model can follow the few shot exemplars. So you have this like pretty complicated like um, uh, uh, chain of thought where the model has to like sort each of the subparts, um, And then finally it gets to the, the final answer, which is correct. Um, so here's sort of this result summary on, on this subset um, of, of Big Bench. So you can see, okay, uh, we have uh, two metrics. Uh, one is just the average performance on all these tasks. Um, and the second uh, is the percent of tasks that are um, above uh, the average human rater. So uh, average human rater is 67, max human rater is 94. Um, and then prior results, uh, the model was doing like way worse, it was like 50. Um, and this is sort of by, by, def, by construction um, of the subset. Um, and then we use Code DaVinci O2, which is like one of the OpenAI models. 
Um, and actually, you can use this one for free uh, with the OpenAI API. Um, and basically, uh, if you do answer only prompting without chain of thought, then you sort of are beating the average generator on like five of 27. But if you use chain of thought prompting, uh, then the performance increases by this uh, pretty decent amount and you're able to pass uh, the human, uh, average human on the majority of tasks. Um, and then below is just this visualization of uh, the tasks that are doing worse than humans in red and then better than humans in, uh, in blue. Yeah. Two questions. One is, isn't this similar to RLHF in spirit at least? Uh, is what similar? Uh, I think chain of thought problem. I'm not sure what the statement is. I think chain of thought. Um, yeah, I think, uh, it's, uh, there, I wouldn't call it similar. So like chain of thought is basically you take a pre-trained language model and you use a prompting technique that includes intermediate reasoning path. Um, the way that RLHF works is that you have this additional data that you want to fine tune the model on and you have a preference model that sort of predicts like how well does a certain output, um, uh, uh, how, how likely is that to be preferred by humans? Um, and then RLHF, uh, what that does is it fine tunes the model. It fine tunes like the language model to do well uh, on the preference model's prediction. So basically, uh, it's it's sort of aligning the model with what humans would prefer. Is there a second question? Uh, yeah, sorry, there's, there's a few. Um, okay. Uh, Andreas asks, can chain of thought be encoded in fine tuning rather than having to be in the thought? Um, Yes, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the sort of complicated thing about that is that you have to have like chain of thought intermediate steps and those are pretty, um, uh, it can be costly to sort of uh, to, to gather that data and to do the fine tuning. One last question, sorry for everybody. Here. Yeah, yeah no, no. Uh, Another student asks, do you think that chain of thought and prompt engineering in general is just an artifact that won't be necessary for larger scale models? that are better able to understand the promise through. Yeah, so I, that's a great question. Um, uh, basically the question is like, how like ephemeral is like prompt engineering gonna be? Um, I think uh, we'll find out, but um, some initial intuitions are that like for easy tasks that are like, you know, easy to describe and maybe they're multiple choice, um, larger models will probably be more robust to prompt engineering and there's sort of less you can do with that. But I think as language models get more powerful, um, it'll sort of be more normal to use them on a lot, a lot more challenging tasks. Um, and in those tasks, you'll have to specify exactly what you, what, what you want the model to do, et cetera. So I think there'll still be some room for prompt engineering there, at least in the near future. Um, yeah, go ahead. Do you know how uh, this chain of thought prompting is generalizing? So for example, if you show these two tasks, right, a simple math and a math, and then the other one basically sorting the words alphabetically, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I see that, okay, if you have a math, math class, you get this chain of thought, uh, chain of thought prompting, then it does that super well. But would, would that model also perform better on sorting the alphabet, or do you have to give the chain of thought for like sorting words on the Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, for some tasks where you've seen similar data in pre training, the model can do really well, even if the chain of thought is from another task. Um, so for example, like math word problems, you actually don't really need a math chain of thought because the model already knows how to do that. But like for a task like this, you probably haven't seen any data that's like the chain of thought here. So without task specific exemplars, you probably wouldn't do super well on tasks like this without um, manually writing them uh, for, for other examples. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering like as the researcher behind this, like what mental model would lead you to like even try this? Like, do you perceive the model as like, if I was a person, how would I do this better? Or is it like trying to give it more like uh, compute in order to like, like before it gets to the answer? Yeah, great question. Um, I think my motivation was just thinking about it, just as you said, like what's going on in sort of a human's mind while they try to solve this math question. Um, and uh, well, if you notice like at least some humans well, think actually in natural language. Um, so like, if you just like uh, think about it, like if you pay attention a lot to like what's going on in your mind, you actually notice that you'll, sometimes you think in language. And so while well, the language model can think in language too. So that was kind of the motivation behind um, asking language model to do that. Um, and I think um, uh, one thing that sort of went well is that uh, the development of like this technique actually coincided with like the development of Palm 
Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, basically having the model palm sort of allowed us to do a lot uh, better tasks or a lot more challenging tasks uh, using chain of thought. Yeah. So when talking about the data quality, like we're saying that it matters that the absolute number of examples of like this chain of thought process or whatever in the data set um, or in the fine tuning, is that, is, is that the main significant thing or is it like this is relative number of frequency of like those examples or just like negative examples which are like not good examples of how to reason like do those matter as much as just the absolute number of um, good examples? Yeah, good question. Um, so I guess the challenging thing is like, we can't really measure how many similar examples are in the training set or, uh, you know, it's it's hard to do that well. And uh, no, I don't think anyone has done that before. So it's more of this open question of like why uh, chain of thought even works because you actually don't see a similar data like that in the training set. Um, yeah, I, I think it's an open question like why it works. Yeah. Someone said in his question, like, what is your mental model for like general thoughts? Like, what is the intuition? That, like, when you said, okay, think about like how, um, you know, human things, like, sometimes we think in language and that model should do that too. But, like, how do you actually think, like, in, like, what is the intuition for the model? Like, I mean, is there like a shift in, for a specific task, like, some weights get like more focus from the model? Or, like, how do you think about it? Yeah, I don't really think about it in terms of like what's going on in the weights. I guess the way that I think about it is that like um, it'd be unfair if, for me to like give you a math question and ask you to give me the answer within like half a second, which is basically like what you're doing with the model and when you don't do a chain of thought, right? You're basically asking this like challenging question and the model doesn't have enough compute to like solve it in one pass to give you the next the answer immediately. Um, I think the second thing that... Um, uh, I sort of think about is that like um, the model has learned like a compositional set of skills um, during during pre-training, so maybe it hasn't really learned like you know this particular navigate task during pre-training, but it's learned other things, right? It's learned like okay, if you uh, take five steps and you're facing this, maybe yeah, you should add five here or something like that, right? Um, and it's learned how to do pattern matching, so uh, maybe in the future exemplars it can match sort of. Uh, what the reasoning path is with like what the question was. And so there's sort of these little skills that the model might know. Um, and then maybe if you can combine them together in some clever way, then you can get the model to solve a more challenging problems. Um, okay. Ryan, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, we have half hour. Oh, okay, 50, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, great. That's a good example of how we judge these tasks in a way. A bunch of different answers, all of them are right. That we judge <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, feel free to keep asking questions if you have any. Um, so, uh, yeah, here's another example of emergence. So, basically, you can see there's three models here Instruct GPT, Codex, and Palm. Chain of thought in blue and non-chain of thought uh, is in uh, is in gray, and then you can see uh, you actually have to have sufficient model scale to get chain of thought to work well. Um, and uh, I guess the intuition here is that like if you have a really small model, uh, the the model sort of will keep repeating itself or not saying anything coherent and never get a final answer, which is why using chain of thought for the small models doesn't really work well. Um, and then for the large models, obviously, you know, for multi-step or like for multi-step problems, uh, the model is going to uh, be able to solve the task at a lot higher accuracy with chain of thought. Um, and another cool thing about chain of thought is there are sort of some tasks where um, you sort of wouldn't get emergent behavior at all. Uh, so you know, emergence hasn't been unlocked uh, yet, um, but. Uh, you can see that the uh, if you use chain of thought, you can unlock this emergent performance uh, in, in smaller models. So uh, one example here is like multi-step arithmetic where like, I don't know if you'll ever, you know, maybe I don't want to say never, but like it, you can, it's hard to imagine a model like getting this, you know, here's the question and then the next token is correct. That, that's pretty hard to solve in one step. Um, but with chain of thought, you can get like, you know, 50% accuracy on this just by having the model um, output um, these intermediate uh, intermediate reasoning steps. 
Oh, yeah. This is something that, like, makes it for me to have intuition about what's going on. Okay. It's like, abstractly, I know that, like, a transformer can definitely do addition. Yeah. Like, it would take, right, in one step, but it can, like, take in the numbers and, like, do the carries. And definitely, that. yeah, yeah. But, like, um, then like, there's this question of, like, what happens empirically, right? And, like, I understand that, like, it isn't necessarily a lot of space to do arithmetic. Yeah. So, like, um, my question is, like, how, how do we, like, uh, tell the difference? Like, maybe, are there, like, ways to tell the difference between, like, things that haven't emerged because, like, there's just, like, no space? Or, like, mm. um, like, like, there's so many tasks that, like, it couldn't have, like, allotted any any space to specifically do that one versus like uh, like the, the task is so hard that like like it just can't even if you like you yeah all the capacity to try and do it. Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, there there seems to be like some subset of tasks mm -hmm. where uh, it's just like doesn't fit well with the way that we train language models. So for example like in language models we use tokens, right? And so if you give it like the token four, it actually doesn't take the number four. It takes like this embedding that's like, you know, 1000 dimensions or something. Or if you like give it a word and ask it to reverse like the letters, this is like a super easy task, but like the way we train the model doesn't actually look at the letters and stuff. So I think there's a certain subset of tasks where like um, it doesn't really just fit well with the way that we train transformers. And um, you can actually like, I mean, I think these, if you really care about these tasks, you can just solve them uh, using like code or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I don't think like this is really an inherent, um, something that would never emerge because it's too hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. We have a question on Zoom. Also, by the way, sorry, I forgot to mention, somebody asked, can you repeat the questions? Because they can't always hear the answers. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's my bad, that's my bad. Um, so the question someone asked is, do you think chain of thought will be a viable interpretability technique for very advanced AI systems? And they mentioned that there is some research by Anthropic called Externalized Reasoning Oversight by Tamara Landon. Uh, oh. Is, will it be a viable interpretability technique for advanced AI? Um. Yeah, am I supposed to repeat this? Yeah, yeah, sorry, please. Oh, so the question is, um, can chain of thought be a viable uh, interpretability technique for AI? I think um, there's no guarantee that like the chain of thought is how the model actually arrives at the final answer. Um, but often you can use it to like sort of debug, like why isn't the model getting this question correct? Or like, um, what, what, what can we do better in the chain of thought to help the model get this correct? Um, I haven't read the Anthropic paper that, that was mentioned, so I, I just don't know the answer to that. Um, okay. Um, another uh, interesting uh, result that we had here was that uh, uh, you can actually do like multilingual chain of thought prompting. Um, and so basically what we had is like, we translated this like, uh, you know, benchmark of math word problems to 10 languages. Um, and then we prompt them, uh, the model to do it in like say Bengali. Uh, and then the model has to like basically do the math problem in Bengali um, and give the final answer. Um, I think the cool thing about this is that like this input is like highly improbable, right? So like Bengali is like 0.01% of the pre-training data and uh, you know, math word problems are probably even smaller subset of that. Um, and basically the interesting thing is the model can actually do like uh, these types of questions pretty well. Uh, it's a probably a surprising degree. So like, you know, if you ask people before I, I showed them this result, like, oh, how well can the model do like these math questions in Swahili? Like, oh, probably like 10%. But actually um, even like, you know, very underrepresented languages like uh, Swahili or Bengali or uh, Telugu and, and, and Thai, um, the model can do so like surprisingly well, despite the fact that they only occupy like a very small uh, subset of the, the pre-trained data. Yeah. Actually speaking to this and most of my experience with this is with ChatGPT, but like if you ask it things in different languages, despite not being like explicitly trained in these languages, right? It seems mm -hmm. to have sort of like derived reasoning independent of language to some extent. Yeah. You can do the reasoning. Actually, it's kind of funny. Like sometimes it always looks like it does the reasoning in English and then translates back to the other language because uh. like the like answers it gives you is sort of like if you like reason in English and then translate to the other thing. So do you uh. think that like uh, learning the like structure of a language and learning reasoning abilities are like somewhat separate in large language models? 
or that like it inherently will like learn chain of thought reasoning within that language, within the structure of the language, like the way thought works in that language. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure how to measure that, but uh, I've definitely thought about it. I think the language, I mean, based on these results, like you definitely probably, you probably didn't have any math questions in Swahili for the, for the model to learn from. And I think definitely there's something language agnostic going on where the model learns reasoning sort of independently of the language and then it can express it in different languages if it, if it needs to. Yeah, but I, I don't have a, I don't think anyone, I, I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so basically like, one question that uh, comes up frequently is like, why does scaling up improve chain of thought? Um, and one way of looking at this is like, we can take a smaller model like POM 62B and see like what types of errors are fixed from scaling up to 540 domain parameters. Um, and you can see that like for, for these three categories that we came up with, um, some of all of them get fixed. So scaling seems to have this like sort of universal effect on improving uh, different types of errors from solid models. Um, and then here's this, the same hand wavy diagram expressed in different ways. So basically you have like some tasks that are doable with standard prompting, so in blue. Um, and then uh, the, the goal of chain of thought prompting is to sort of increase the, subs, the, the, the set of tasks that we can do. So for example, now uh, the ones shown in uh, pink include math word problems, symbolic reasoning, and, and com uh, challenging common sense reasoning, yeah. One more question. Have you done any compilations to figure out how uh, like much is, is any of this contribution just because of the fact that you do more computations with the, when you put in longer prompts? Like uh, you know, like you do multiple tasks through the model, you create multiple embeddings to sort of like you know adjust the things the model is looking at in a way. Yeah. How much of that like have you tried non chain of thought prompts with like same token length? Anything? Yeah, yeah. We tried with like uh, x x x x x or something, and it doesn't really it doesn't work. I see. So I think it's not just about the compute. I think it's about the language guiding the model uh, as part of the reasoning. Yeah. I see. Have you tried like describing the problem in more detail than not doing I know this is like a super mm -hmm. interesting question. I'm just very curious about like this is like a very interesting uh, property, and I'm very curious like exactly how it fits in. Yeah, you mean like describing the question in three different ways and seeing yeah, if just, that. Yeah, like describing the question in more detail instead of like explicitly doing the step by step thing and seeing how that like. Yeah, I haven't tried that, but I would be uh, surprised if that worked. I see. Yeah. Oh, you could edit the question. Did you, did you try having it output the answer and then explain its reasoning? And did that? Yeah, that doesn't work as well. Okay. Yeah, okay. but it depends on the task also. So like. Yeah. 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 So, so like, um, it that seems to be the case. Yeah. Yep. Does it really have to be like reasoning? Can we be like just any amount of extra calculation? Sort of kind of the worst the answer. Like in a way, you know, like in a way, like in a black tabulation, chain of thought is like a very sort of structured thing. It's like what if the same structure is preserved, but like we do some more random things? Yeah. Um, you could try it. I would be surprised if it works. I I I I think like outputting tokens um, is pretty important for the for the model. Yeah. Okay, um, so we're doing on time. Okay, great. So uh, the last part I think is a pretty cool trick with chain of thought. So basically um, what people usually do is they'll just generate one chain of thought um, and then they'll, they'll take the final answer. But there's this nice trick called self-consistency where you can use like temperature sampling with the model to generate like a bunch of different uh, reasoning paths and final answers. Um, and then if you just take a majority vote over the final answers, this ends up like improving performance by like a pretty big margin. So uh, for example, here um, you can see on GSM AK, which is like the math word problem data set, um, the improvement goes from like, uh, you know, the, the performance like 56. And then if you do self-consistency, then it becomes 74, which is like a pretty big improvement. Quick clarification yeah. Here, how many are we averaging over? Oh, I think 40. So it, it increases the cost of the inference time compute, um, but uh, yeah, it improves performance by a lot. You might be about to answer this, but I'm curious to know how many samples or how many chains does one need to draw to get a significant, like what is the trade off between number of chains averaged over yeah. performance gain? Um, I think uh, it depends on the, uh, 
sorry, the question is how many chains do you need to get a performance gain? Uh, I think the, um, the answer really depends on the data set. Um, but usually you can get something good with like 16, I think. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we have a question. How does the temperature change the way the model works? Oh, okay. Uh, the question is, how does the temperature change the way the model works? Um, basically, when you use temperature um, uh, decoding, the language model um, can like stochastically pick one of the outputs instead of always picking the highest probability next word. Um, so basically, you get these like uh, more stochastic outputs that um, are still uh, based on what the language model has learned, but it's just uh, a little bit more random. Okay. Um, and then, like, finally, like, yeah, self-consistency also seems to be emergentability. I guess part of it is because chain of thought is emergent because uh, you wouldn't get, you know, any better than the random performance um, uh, uh, without uh, doing chain of thought. But, um, uh, yeah, you, you kind of see this big delta from uh, self-consistency for larger models. Um, great. So... Uh, I'm gonna run out of time. Let me just go to, uh, I'll just talk about this a little bit. So um, I think uh, in addition to just purely scaling up the language model, which is only available to like people in the industry, I think there's like a couple interesting directions to, um, to work on. Um, one is like better prompting and characterization of language model abilities. I think right now we're sort of just at the edge of, uh, you know, knowing what the best way to prompt language models is. Um, there's also like pretty good applied work. So like uh, you can use language models I've heard to train therapists uh, to help with creative writing, to help with um, science. I think ChatGPT has really shown um, what language models can do in, in this regard. Um, I think benchmarks uh, are also uh, something that's pretty lacking because I think uh, we solve benchmarks pretty quickly. Um, for example, Palm beat the average human on Big Bench, uh, you know, within a year or something of Big Bench coming out. Uh, so, so I think we need more uh, benchmarks, and that's that's that. I think that's going to be an important contribution. And then the final one is like, how can we like uh, have compute efficient methods to to make language models better, um, so that uh, you know it, it's 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 less expensive to use them and, and more people can get to use them. Um, great. So uh, I'll end here. Okay. Um, and feel free to email me if you have any any feedback, and if you're interested in Google, uh, yeah, feel free to email me as well. Oh, um, thanks. Thank you.